I'm Nora McInerney, and this is Terrible Thanks for Asking. Some people just know from a young age who they want to be when they grow up. Not like how every really little kid says they're going to be a firefighter or a farmer or an astronaut. It's like, get creative. There are more than three jobs. But truly, some people, by the time they're tweens, say things like, I'm going to grow up to be an actuary. This is not a joke. I knew a kid like this growing up. Or I'm going to be a businesswoman, like my friend Kara said when she was growing up. And guess what? She is a businesswoman. Some people are just like that. Some people look around their little kid life and they just see what they're going to be. And some kids look around their little kid life and they're like, "Mm, no, I don't see myself following any of these paths. I don't see myself climbing a corporate ladder. They don't know what exactly they want to do, but they do know in their heart that they're getting somewhere. Abdi was that kind of kid. He looked at the world and he saw possibilities that other kids just didn't see. He was in middle school when he started his first side hustle. Back then, like, Jordans were really popular, right? I stand in line and then I'd buy like two of them and then like I'd sell them and make like a $50 or like $70 profit on it. And like middle school, like, you know, $70 is like a lot of money, you know? So I'd do that like twice a month. And then in high school, I really dived more into like side hustles. And that's when I had like my first job. And that's when I realized I truly love being an entrepreneur. Abdi knew, as he was selling sneakers out of his locker, that he found the thing he loved. Business. Entrepreneurship. Salman found that same passion, but on the internet, when he makes his first toolbar for Microsoft Firefox. And it was really awesome. And like, it got like 200,000 downloads and it was like widely used. And, you know, that was like a defining moment for me, like where it's like, nobody knows who this kid is. Nobody knows who I am, but they love and enjoy using my product. Abdi and Salman are now friends and business partners. Their business is called Team Top Figure, and this is what they do. So the main thing is really, you know, our agency, what we do is we really help clients scale online on through social media. And that we help them with their creative work, setting them up with, you know, visually, uh, you know, with the right videography and telling their story uh, through running ads. That is one leg of our business. And we also have, you know, for people who want to achieve, you know, financial freedom and really build their own e-commerce brands. You know, that's what we do on a day-to-day basis, really help people do what we do and really help them online. Their business is the result of their passion for creating, for collaborating. It reflects their ambition and their accomplishments and their origins. Because even though they grew up in different cities, they also grew up in similar worlds. I grew up in, um, Des Moines, Iowa, and pretty much, you know, um, the Somali community and, like, minority community isn't as big over there, you know, so I went to, like, a middle school that's predominantly, like, all white, you know. The diversity was very small there, you know, it was, like, very, very small percentage, but, like, some of the kids, since they were all young, I was, like, the first time that they became friends with, like, an African-American, especially the Somali, you know, there wasn't that many Somali over there. And you could kind of see that they weren't used to it. So starting young, very at a young age, you know, you could kind of feel like the black sheep, you know, like you could kind of see that you're an outsider and like you kind of don't belong. But like the biggest thing for me was even at a young age, I started to realize like it only gets to you like when you let it get to you, you know. So the main thing for me was just like, moving on like and how I could actually make an impact through this how I could stay positive through it how do I not let it affect me how do I not let it affect my grades and all these things and we weren't talking about it in school but like you can definitely like see the vibe you know you can definitely see like you're you're not like as welcomed you know there was there'd be like birthday parties that some of so-called friends were having and I won't get invited Salman grew up 
right outside the Twin Cities in Minnesota in a predominantly white suburb at a predominantly white school. I was always kind of like the oddball out. Like one thing that really allowed me to feel comfortable and, and safe was in my environment of just being behind a computer and really building projects online. And that's where my passion really came about. It's not simply that the two of them felt like outsiders in their mostly white environments, although, yeah, there's that. It's that they also felt like outsiders within their family units. Abdi and Salman are each the children of Somali refugees. Their parents fled Somalia during the country's civil war, a diaspora where thousands of Somali people were resettled in Iowa and Minnesota. Which is a fun fact about Minneapolis is that it has the largest Somali population in the U.S. Isn't that neat? When Salman told his parents about how he was making toolbars online and he thought he could work for himself one day. They did not like it whatsoever. They were like, it's not making any money or anything like that. And it was like, focus on your schoolwork, focus on your schoolwork, focus on your schoolwork, focus on your schoolwork. Like, this stuff is, is, is not going to make you any money. Like, they came from a war torn country here and their only way of success is go to school, get a job. That's it. That's literally the only route that they saw. They hadn't seen anything else. They hadn't seen any other sort of success, you know? Like, this was somewhat working for them. My dad was able to pay our bills, move us into a better home. And, like, you know, he was working constantly all day and night. I would barely see him, but I would always just be on my computer all day long just building things. And I was like, okay, there has to be a different way. Like, they came to the United States to really you know, just make it and just to achieve the uh, financial freedom and watching them struggle to work two jobs and just, you know, the main thing to them was, hey, education is the way for success. That was literally the only formula that they were taught and really having my dad be a school teacher. That was one thing they preached on us consistently. So, you know, really, they didn't really support us to do extracurricular activities and things like that. They were just like, hey, focus on school, focus on school, get a job, get a job. That's what Abdi and Salman each do. I mean, they have their passions and their side hustles, but they also get good grades and they work and they help with the bills. And after high school, they end up at the same community college, which is where our two heroes finally meet. In the place where so many friendships are known to blossom. Instagram. And while I was working there, I was just on Instagram and I was sharing like, hey, I build websites. And then we bumped into each other at Anoka Ramsey. And like he saw that I was like, you know, really vocal about this. And they, he was like, I can really find you clients. Like, let's work together. And that's how me and Abdi met. And like, you know, he, he came over to my office and he saw what I was doing and everything. And he was like, hey, let me split the run with, let's work on this and let's get clients together. And that was like a defining moment. And like, Ever since we've hit it off and like we've just been like really helped so many small businesses in Minnesota. And that was like uh, the first agency we started together called First Web Group. And I found like an office space. It was like $400 a month. Like I, I went and signed it. It was like, you know, a 12 year lease. I didn't even have the money up front. He meant a 12 month lease, but the idea is the same. He was betting on himself. And it's that office where Abdi started working, too where the two of them started their own company, a digital marketing agency they called First Web Group. Abdi already had a job, though. He had an internship at a large medical device company, which, if he was really going to go all in with Salman, he needed to quit, which he needed to tell his parents. And as soon as I told them that, they were, like, just shocked. You know, they were just like, no, 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 no. But it took some convincing, and they were like, okay, you have one year, <laughs> you know, prove yourself in one year. And that year was really bad. You know, the first year of business is not easy, especially I had like no guidance, no knowledge and everything. And it was just bad. It wasn't all bad. It's just they had some learning curves because they were 19 years old and they were just starting out. And because it's very, very hard to figure out your value in the marketplace when you're not just making things for your friends or your friends' friends. One day, a guy who owns a home health care company approaches them about a website. He came and he was like, hey, I need a way for people to find me online. How could you guys help me? And we were like, you know, should we charge him and all that kind of stuff? Like, we were super excited. We were like, how about $400? Like, you know. <laughs> $400 is exactly their rent, so not bad. But also, 
not great. We forgot that we were gonna pay for the hosting. Okay, let's just cover it. And then it's like we ended up realizing like we spent like five hundred and sixty dollars like on the on the client, but you know it was like <laughs> it was at a loss. But the thing is, it was like okay, wow, like we can get a client. We just have to know our value. Next. Do you know what I mean? Like we have to know how much we should price our products and how we um, do this the next time. So they eat that cost. They lose some money. They've each told their parents that if it didn't work out in a year, they'd go back to school and follow the path their parents expect of them. And they really, really don't want to do that. The guy who got a website for only $400, including hosting, is very happy with the work. And he refers more people who refer more people. And still... We would always be able to just barely make rent. But we had so much fun, but we had so much pressure, too, as well. You know, it was like... We, we weren't making any money. We were just like breaking even or at a loss every single month. And like we were doing side hustles. We were like driving Lyft on the side. And like we were selling phones too as well out of that office. Like we would buy broken phones, repair them. Like we would repair them and like we would use that to pay for rent and website hosting costs and stuff like that. But it was just a grind all year. It was hard. And it was also magical. Every day they woke up and they went to work in a space that was theirs as long as they made the rent. And we had no plan on how we were going to pay the money. We were just like, okay. And we also had other bills on top of that, too. That wasn't just it. Maybe it wasn't the smartest to, to do at the moment, but it was the most uncomfortable thing we did in our life. You know, especially Sal, because he's the one that put it under his name. But the thing that that did for us was we were just there working every day. That's one thing that helped. You know, it helped, like... Today we gotta do this, today we gotta do this, because somehow, some way, we gotta figure this out because now we have a liability that we have to take care of. They each played to their strengths and made the other stronger. Salman made the websites, Abdi kept the clients happy, and they kept each other on track, which is really difficult and very important. When you're working for yourself, you have to be self-disciplined. You have to, like, teach yourself these things. You have to tell yourself, wake up at this time. You have to tell yourself, you got to leave now. You have to tell yourself, you have to do this. It's doing the things you don't want to do because you essentially don't have a boss. You, you're the one that's telling yourself these things. And it's so easy to forget that. It's so easy to forget that and just pull out your phone for an extra five minutes. Five minutes turns into 10 minutes, 10 minutes turns into 15. And there's nobody telling you, get back to work, get back to work, get back to work. And that was so hard for us at the beginning, finding that amongst ourselves and telling ourselves, like, get back to work, fix this, fix that, you know? We read Think and Grow Rich. We read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Like, you know, we. We went to networking events, and that's how we met other mentors that would really, like, you know, um, support us and really help us, like, hey, you know, hey, I can help you guys and, you know, educate you guys on what to do next and all that kind of stuff. And my mentor was, you know, he was a, he's also, a, he's an African-American, you know, business owner. And I met him at a networking event, and, you know, he was just, he saw how we were building websites, and he was seeing how we were really active on social and everything. And he coached us and mentored us. And the one thing that really stuck out to us was, Mindset was really the key to success. It didn't matter what we did, it didn't matter what we were doing. At the end of the day, we will always remain positive in any circumstance, whether we lost a client, whether we had a bad deal happen, like, you know, where we didn't make any money or anything like that, where we got taken advantage of. At the end of the day, we stayed positive, we stayed true to each other. Time for a quick break. We're back. Abdi and Selman are two entrepreneurs who are building their business. They're not making a ton of money yet, but they have a year to prove to their parents and themselves that 
this dream isn't crazy. Even though we weren't making like uh, much money, we didn't let that really control our situation. We didn't let that con- we didn't let that control how we operate the business. We didn't let things like that get to us. The biggest thing for us was, did we do enough today? You know, did we do more than yesterday? We lacked like previous knowledge in this industry. You know, we were learning as we were going. You know, and that's why, as he mentioned earlier, the networking events were so huge because we were just learning so much from that. You know, we were just learning something new every day. That was the thing that we always said, learn something new every day. From their mentor, they've learned the importance of mindset, to not let anything get them down and to keep pushing their business forward. But it's not all about mindset. It wasn't when they were kids, and it wasn't as young adults starting a business. The two of them are still black in a state, Minnesota, that is very white. And not just white, but home to the Minnesota paradox a term coined by University of Minnesota economist Samuel L. Myers that reflects the realities of the state, that it's a great place to live for some people. Minnesota has some of the biggest income disparities between black and white residents, some of the biggest disparities in home ownership, and a big disparity in lending practices, too. A 2015 study of the 50 largest banks in Minnesota showed that minorities were disproportionately more likely to have their loan applications rejected than white applicants, even after controlling for qualifications. Abdi and Salman don't know all of that. They just know that when they walk into networking events in Minnesota... Majority of them were predominantly white, middle-aged men. The networking events we were going to, we would stick out like a sore thumb. Like, we were very active on meetup.com and very active in Facebook groups. You know, we would always go to like, you know, meetup groups. And like in in the beginning, it was very cold. Like people wouldn't approach us. They would just think that we were with like some sort of school project or something like that, you know? And like, that was one of the things that really like, really like mess, uh, you know, like with our, like our heads, but we didn't let that get to us because it was just so frustrating to deal with that, you know? There was not a single Somali or even African person at these because they don't really go to these like type of bars or anything like that. Like, so we would always stick out like a sore thumb everywhere we went. One thing we did is we really kept on going and just really building, um, uh, you know, our business and kept on going and really showing proof of like, okay, hey, what we're doing is working. And we just kept on going and kept on going and kept on going and really like we would just get feedback from them on, okay, what do we need to improve next? On top of their agency work, they also start to develop an app. They don't have any investment money. They aren't sure how to approach investors about this project without a minimum viable product. So they start building it. And like everything else, they fund it themselves. So on top of working all day for their clients, they're also working on this app, going to networking events. And right after we'd be hitting Lyft or Uber and then like getting more capital for our app. And that's where we realized, okay, we need some funding to be able to really get this app off the ground. So we were like, okay, let's at least let's at least get money together to build a mock-up. We have so much responsibilities while on top of that, making sure our, you know, working uh, for our families, you know, uh, making sure our business stays alive and funding a new business idea. Like it was just a lot, you know, and that's one thing we were realizing, okay, uh, we're like, we need about. $10,000 to get this mobile app fully finished. $10,000 is a lot of money, but not when it comes to investors. Truly, the venture capital pool was over $13 billion, that's with a B, dollars in 2019. Also, if you don't know what venture funding is, and uh, I did not, it's private investment money put into high-risk businesses that appear to have long-term growth potential. Things like apps. Yes. So going into the meeting, you know, like we were just excited, like stoked up. We have we have an idea, a brilliant idea. We went at the extra mile. We went into a competition and we got second place at a startup grind conference that we were at networking. We found this this competition just from networking alone. We went to so many of these networking events and, you know, they were like, hey, your idea is really cool. And we went into a um a little incubator and like we had a two day sprint where we created the idea, pitched it to judges and we won second place. So that's the moment when we started to go and like, Hey, our idea has traction. Like people validate our idea. 
we can go to investors now and get this app up and running because we are passionate about this and we need this to go. We went there and they were like, you guys haven't made any money with the app. Um, and, you know, like, sure, you guys have the right resources and everything, but you guys just don't have enough sales, you know, for us to invest. And then we were like, okay, we need to get more sales. We need to get more revenue. And like, that's when we went back to the drawing board and we were like, okay, let's go ahead and do that. Part of that drawing board was making a hire, which is risky because they were barely making it, but they needed help. The person they hire is young, like them, barely out of college. Her role is as an assistant and a Jill of all trades. So basically we hired her to really help out with creating content, creating that, and really just like generating us, you know, really leads and things like that. That's mainly what we hired her for, really just like, hey, can you help us create content and really like things that we need for clients. And, and sometimes we'll bring you into client facing meetings where we would, you know, just have her just collect data and things like that. And then when we had an idea was like, let's maybe have her lead the meeting. Here's what happens in these meetings. The app is the same, the idea is the same, but when she leads them, they start closing business. The app starts making money. And yeah, she's good at her job. And also, she's a young white woman presenting the work of these young black men to other older white people. And that's when we realized a stark reality that maybe we need to sit on the back burner of our company. So maybe that's a coincidence. Maybe she's just that good. But when you look at the bigger picture, at that $13 billion in venture funding, you will also see that Black-founded companies received only 1% of that $13 billion. 1%. So that 10000 they are seeking is like 0.0008% of the total venture capital pie. It's nothing. Abdi and Salman are seeing this happening to their business, to themselves, and they're also not going to let it get to them. The app is working, their client work is picking up, and they have plenty of work to do. Remember, they believe in mindset. They've just moved into a much better office with really nice amenities. Just like have a routine, you know, so we just do work and work out at like 6 p.m. every day. You know, we were just working out, working out, working out, working out, working out, you know, because, you know, health is wealth. So that gym, it was just awesome, you know, that it was a part of the membership, you know, it came along with it. That was one huge perk for us, you know, as we did have another gym membership before, we are just like, hey, let's just cancel the gym membership. Just work out here every day, you know, it's convenient. We just come right downstairs, take a shower, go home right after, and, It was awesome, you know, that was the best part. It was a cozier gym that does all the job and they also had a shower there and it was just downstairs of our office. So it made total sense. Time for a quick break. We're back. Abdi and Salman and their company are all based in Minneapolis. They live that Minnesota paradox we talked about before. On May 25th, George Floyd was killed by the Minneapolis Police Department. By the end of May and beginning of June, the city of Minneapolis and cities around the country were exploding into a civil rights uprising. The truth about Minneapolis, always listed in these Best Places to Live articles, is that It's a great place for white people to live. The city is extremely segregated. And the fancy new office that Salman and Abdi rented is in an affluent and very white neighborhood, the kind of neighborhood where multi-million dollar homes line a chain of lakes. One of those lakes was called Lake Calhoun, named for John C. Calhoun, a proponent of slavery who was a statesman of South Carolina. In other words, he didn't even go here. We named a lake after him. In 2017, the Minneapolis Park Board petitioned to change the name to Bidet Makaska, the Dakota name, and some people in the neighborhood went off. One guy wrote an op-ed in the Minneapolis Star Tribune titled, 
why I funded the lawsuit to save the name Lake Calhoun, and I quote, My motive to fight for Lake Calhoun had less to do with trying to save the name itself and more to do with fighting for fairness and justice for everyday Minnesotans. Everyday Minnesotans just want to be left alone and not bullied into changing the names of our lakes, our streets, our schools, our landmarks, and our cities. We're sick of the, quote, holier-than-thou, end quote, morality tone coming from politicians, media, and activists. So I don't know what he means when he says everyday Minnesotans, but he lives in one of the most expensive neighborhoods in Minneapolis and funded a lawsuit, which doesn't sound cheap. He had a whole campaign on SaveLakeCalhoun.com until the domain expired and someone snapped it up. So if you visit that website now, it says, actually, it's called Bidet Makaska because obviously... Some people, some everyday Minnesotans, unlike those special occasion Minnesotans you're always hearing about, are lovely and funny. But back to 2020. It's been a day since George Floyd was killed. Abdi and Salman are at the gym in their office building with their other colleagues trying to maintain their routine. We were already shaken by the incident that happened and how sad that he got murdered, especially the way he did, you know getting suffocated like that. I don't wish that upon anybody. Like one of the worst ways to like, you know, leave, you know, die. Normally, there's nobody in the gym except them. But today, another guy comes in. He's older, white, blonde hair. You could tell like, you know, really right away from his demeanor and everything, you know, looking at us from like a side eye, just like, you know, making us feel uncomfortable. And, you know, we we just proceed to just continue to working out. And, you know, we were we saw that he had, you know, a weird energy vibe from him. And, you know, we were just working out, you know, just going through rotation, doing our back workouts. He was looking at us oddly. And, you know, he started working out next to us and just staring at us. You know, it was just felt uncomfortable. The few other times there have been people in the gym, they've had conversations, made connections, talked about their businesses, exchanged information. Making connections is as much a habit for them as working out or reading or working. But this guy in the gym has just one question, basically, which is, are you tenants of this building? Abdi and Salman and their friends say, yep, yeah, we're tenants. It'd be hard to get into the building without being a tenant. You need fobs, key cards, and also, who breaks into a building to work out? The man starts to take pictures of Abdi and Salman and their colleagues. That's when we realized, okay, nobody's going to believe our side of our story. We need to record and we need to have our voice heard. So that's when we recorded and you can see us repeatedly say, yes, we are tenants in the building. What'd you say we can't do? I'm Tom Austin. I'm a tenant in the building. Are you? We're all tenants in this building. What what, what, what office? Don't worry about that. I'm going to say What office? So we have an office here and this guy came accusing us. But it doesn't end there. And Abdi and Salman and their friends have to record it. They feel that their safety depends on it and that even a video might not be enough to keep them safe. The man threatens to call 911, to call the cops, which is threatening in any circumstance, but particularly in a city where Black people make up about 20% of the population, but are subject to 60% of instances where the police get physical. Police use force on Black people seven times more than they do for white folks. As you can see, we're dealing with racism here. Nicole? Hey, this is Tom Austin. I'm going to share with you one day. There's a whole bunch. I don't know what we're doing here, but there's a whole bunch of people who don't hear the department. You know, he asked that question many, many times. Like, are you guys tenants? Are you guys tenants? And it's like, there is no reason that another tenant should go up to another tenant and say, hey, show me your key card, show me your fob, or show me, you know? He could have simply sent an email to like the management office and they could have verified it and then it would be end of story, like no issues. And the thing is in the heat of the moment, we were like, let's just, let's just show it to him. You know what I mean? Like we, we, but then we realized like, hey, come to think of it, we don't need to show him. Like there is no reason to, you know, it's like, we never asked him that, you know what I mean? Like we never came in into his face and said, hey, Show me your key card, you know? And it's like, he would have felt just as uncomfortable as, as we did. 
They leave the gym when they're done working out, and they put the video up on their Instagram page. They don't know who this guy is. They just know that in the building where they've paid rent and worked out for the past year, they were asked by a stranger where their key card was. All we wanted was just people to see what we go through every day. Simple, you know, and how you handle yourselves when these type of situations happen. Because they want a reaction out of you. You know, you shouldn't give them the reaction that they expect. You got to conduct yourself with respect. Got to hold yourself correctly and just document it. You know, our phones are so powerful. Just pull your phone out and document it because if we did not record this, people would have not believed us. This is how we found the story, how you may have already seen the story because it went very viral, very, very viral. Say that again, very, very viral. We're just in our like apartment. We're just like, wow, oh my God. Like, you know, like this is just overwhelming. Like we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to say. And like we were, celebrities were reaching out to us. Like our phones couldn't stop buzzing. And it's like, this is so new to us. We've never went viral before. So it's like, when this happened to us, we were just like, okay, what do we do? What do we do? And automatically the first thing we could think of was like, hey, let's not respond to anybody. Because number one, the media can take it bury and spin it however the way they want to or anything like that. And we don't want to say the wrong thing or anything like that. We want our voice to be heard in the right manner. So what do we do? We call our mentor right away. We speak with him and he's like, hey, you know, just remain calm, you know, reach out to the right people, uh, reach out to uh, an attorney. Here is his number, you know, and like we just went about it like as if it was a regular business. Uh, and like we were like, hey, let's record a public statement that was very professional. Like, let's just let's just be us, you know, let's just be us. Let's just be who we are. And let's just allow our voice to be heard as genuinely as possible. It doesn't take long for the Internet to do its thing. And the Internet found out who this guy was. The same man who created SaveLakeCalhoun.com. The same man who wrote an op-ed where he railed against elites and claimed to fight for everyday Minnesotans. A man who walked into a gym in his office building, saw some young black men, and questioned them like they could be trespassers. He is also a venture capitalist. It's really shocking, especially like when we realize like, wow, like certain people like, you know, um, we could have, you know, just has been in the same room as this guy and really have pitched to him. And he could have really simply disregarded us if we had pitched in front of this guy simply because of that we didn't belong, you know? He could have seen them as peers, as colleagues, as an opportunity. But instead, he asked if they were tenants in the building and he said he was going to call 911. In an email he sent to reporters, he insists that he was not racist, just stupid. But like, here's the thing. We don't get to go back and rewrite our interactions and assign intentions that override the impact of our actions. We don't get to decide what wasn't a big deal because the default settings of the world we live in as white Americans is set to white. That's how a person can say that a lake named for a proponent of slavery isn't connected to slavery because it's not for a person like that because the impacts of slavery haven't adversely affected him. Threatening to call the cops is not dangerous to him because the cops typically don't kill people like him. So there were consequences for this man's actions. The guy that owns the building took his lease away. You know, he lost his lease. And it's, and till this day, like, we don't wish anything bad for him. You know, we still wish Tom the best. In that same email to reporters, this man said, quote, my lease in the office was terminated for the sake of appeasing mob rule. He also said he was no longer CEO of his company. He wrote to us, too. He says he's pissed off that anyone calls what happened in the gym that day racist. He also says he would be, quote, extremely afraid of hiring, quote, a black guy now. That he doesn't, quote, trust blacks. And he says that, quote, the vast majority of white people who speak truthfully in confidence feel the same way. He thought he had a good conversation with the guys during their workouts. He's mad they posted the video, and he still thinks most of them were trespassers. 
Abdi and Zalman say the guys who are with them are colleagues. In the end, we don't know who the property management company believed because they didn't get back to us, but they did terminate that other man's lease. Abdi and Zalman don't work in the building anymore either. In that original op-ed, this man bristled at the idea that people who want to maintain the name of a lake named for a racist would be called racist. He considered it bullying. He didn't seem to leave any space for reflecting on what is racist. We made this episode very carefully. We make all of them carefully, but the reason that we left the most viral part of the story for the end was because, most of all, Abdi and Salman and their business deserve to have their whole story told. To not be defined by one viral video or one interaction with one person, but to be a full story of drive and entrepreneurship and stick to itiveness and whatever other old timey phrases you can come up with that mean a person who works really hard for their dream. A really interesting detail about that day and that viral video is that Abdi and Salman and the rest of their colleagues didn't leave after making that video. They didn't record the interaction and bolt. They stayed for 45 minutes and finished their workout. And the next day, they went back to work at the office they paid for because they know where they belong and they know what they're worth. And it's like something that we really now can just like, not only just like inspire so many people that look like us in business, it just allows us to really, 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 really like set an example, not only to like immigrant communities like too as well, but also anybody who's just aspiring to be an entrepreneur like we really want to be that example for that um, that 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 kid who goes off and decides to do his own thing and like that's our vision with team top figure like you can be a top figure and you can belong in any place any sort of atmosphere whether that be corporate whether that be uh, office building a gymnasium all that If you want to learn more about e-commerce, Abdi and Selman have a program for you. They also sell top figure gear and you can get in touch with them at topfigure.co. If you haven't yet signed up for a TTFA newsletter, you're going to want to do it. It's pretty okay. TTFA.org slash newsletter. We also have a, a shop on bookshop.org. Google it. The links are in the, in the show description. As always, making this episode, I have to thank... Phyllis Fletcher. I have to thank Marcel Malikibu for going above and beyond in every capacity, taking on some more um, racial trauma for the good of public radio and your listening. Uh, they're very talented people, and I am very, very grateful for their uh, leadership and their talents. And I always have a third thing when you're making a list. That's what Liz Lemon taught us. Uh, Jacob Maldonado Medina, uh, additional production help. Uh, Hannah Meacock Ross, uh, still on the team. Jordan Turgeon, still employed. This is. I'm just going to re- read the credits as people who still have a job. All of us. Um, knock on wood. Don't ever just say that, Nora. Jeez Louise, what's wrong with you? I'm Nora McInerney. This has been terrible. Thanks for asking. I don't think I usually say that at the end of the show. I'm recording this in a closet. It is... 10 o'clock at night. This is later than I normally stay up. I'm sweating. I'm sweating. I also realized that in this episode, I said Minnesotan with a hard T. I, it's a it's a hard habit to break when you have to say the T. I also used to say buttons until people made fun of me. And now I, now I just say it like a regular person. Buttons. Okay, buttons. But I usually say buttons. And Minnesotans, it's like when you say it Minnesotans, it's like it just sort of gets swallowed. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it. Again, it's late. Our theme music is by Joffrey Lamar Wilson. We are a production of American Public Media. If if that's too long to say, you know what? You say APM, people also, people will get it. They'll figure out how to Google it and figure out what's going on. 
<sighs> okay, bye.